Um, so welcome. My name is Amy Janess. I'm the programming coordinator at the Nantucket Athenaeum, which is the public library on Nantucket Island in Massachusetts. Um, and we are smack in the middle of National Library Week. Uh, and in a normal world, when we're in the building, we would probably do this great book display of librarians who write and call it good. But this year is a little different. And I was thinking, well, you know, how can we acknowledge National Library Week on Zoom? And I realized that I have a bunch of friends who are writers who work at libraries. And I guess that they would also have friends uh, who were writers that worked at libraries. And so here we are tonight to celebrate librarians who write. Um, so before we start, I just want to let people know a couple of things. I'm gonna mute everybody uh, when we get rolling and then each speaker will have to unmute themselves when it's their turn to read. And also, uh, as we were talking a little bit before, um, you know, the good thing about doing this in a room all together is that we can clap and cheer and stomp our feet for the readers when they're done. And on Zoom, it often feels like you're sitting alone in a room talking to yourself. So I would love it if when a reader is finished, people wanted to unmute themselves and clap and cheer, or you could use the reaction button, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, so let's practice Zoom reactions just to see what they look like. If you click on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, you'll see some chance, uh, some choices there. So pick a choice and click on it and um, let's just see what that looks like. Not quite the same as hooting and hollering, but, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> so, um, so show some love however you are inspired to do so. Um, so in thinking about tonight and thinking about um, librarians who write, um, I, I thought, well, you know, librarians are readers. Yes, um, we know this. Um, libraries are about preserving history, about academic excellence, about helping people of all ages by providing information and a sense of community. But for this library worker, and I suspect everyone you'll hear from tonight, the allure of libraries are the books and the worlds that they hold inside. So it stands to reason that some librarians are drawn to writing or some writers are drawn to working in a library. The great Argentinian librarian and writer, Jorge Luis Borges once said, I've always imagined that paradise will be a kind of library. And I know for me, that even after 16 years of working at the Athenaeum, libraries are magical, not in the utopian perfection way, to be sure, because people talk too loudly, they steal the DVDs, they hoard the cookies at events, but the magic lays in a library's promise to be a place for all people to come in from the cold and learn things while surrounded by staff who wanna help unlock the best of the collection. I also know from experience that librarians are people who get things done. Uh, hang on. <laughs> uh, um, we just lost Beverly Clearly Cleary last week at age 105. While working as a children's librarian in the Pacific Northwest, Beverly noticed that her small patrons were having a hard time finding books that they wanted to read. So she wrote one for them. And by the time she passed, 91 million copies of her books had sold, making her one of the country's most successful writers. Ann Tyler was an assistant librarian at McGill University Law School in Canada when she wrote her first two novels. The English poet Philip Larkin, whose real name is Brunette Coleman, worked in libraries for his whole life while also completing six books of poetry and two novels. And the poet Archibald McLeish served as Librarian of Congress under Franklin D. Roosevelt. After a contentious congressional debate that questioned his patriotism, McLeish was sworn into the role by the local postmaster in Conway, Massachusetts, a tiny town in the Berkshire Hills that McLeish called home. As a librarian of Congress, oh Lord, my mouse is driving me crazy. <laughs> As a librarian of Congress, McLeish said, 
The library, almost alone of the great monuments of civilization, stands taller now than it ever did before. The city decays. The nation loses its grandeur. The university is not always certain what it is, but the library remains a silent and enduring affirmation that the great reports still speak and not alone, but somehow altogether. So tonight we celebrate library workers who write or writers employed by libraries. And I'm pleased to share the Zoom stage with seven others who will tell you why they think libraries are important and why they became writers and maybe the ways in which the two connect. So our first reader tonight is, Cor is Corey Ferenkopf. Corey is a Cape Cod based writer and librarian at the Sturgis Public Library in Barnstable, Massachusetts. He's the fiction editor for the Cape Cod Poetry Review and his fiction has been published by Tiny Nightmares, the Southwest Review, Wigleaf, Flash Fiction Online, Hobart, Bourbon Pen, Catapult and Reckoning. So please welcome Corey Farringcomb. <coughs> Just have to find you on the list here, Corey. Oh, I'm I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay, I'm going to make you spotlight, and then I'm going to cool. go away. All right. Are you going to mute everyone else also? Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Sweet. <laughs> so when I mute everyone else, it's going to include you, and then you'll have to unmute. And I'm unmuted. All right. I do so many of these at the library, so I'm very much with you on the, the mute all move. Um, yeah, so I'm Corey Ferenkopf. I am the assistant director at Sturgis. Uh, Amy said she wanted us to talk a little bit about what we like about libraries beforehand. So here's my little bit about it. Um, I mean, like most writers and most people who are into literature and books and whatnot, like we all have pretty intense stories of like being a child and loving libraries and really bothering the children's librarian about like, hey, how many dinosaur books do you have? What about books on castles? How about, uh, you got anything on myths? And I was one of those kids. And the best part about that is the children's librarian in the town where I, I used to live and now currently live again, uh, is still at the library. So I can show up to the library and be like, hey, Suzanne, remember like when I was a little child just pestering you all the time? And when I say that, I mean, Suzanne is usually the one who will tell me the stories of me being a tiny child who was very annoying. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit of it. And then the other thing that I really love about libraries is free books, you know? <laughs> um, when I first got out of college, I moved back to Cape Cod, which is where I'm from. And uh, I was working like four different jobs at the, at the beginning of everything. And I, uh, I was a, like a, a, an on-call librarian for Brooks Free Library. And while I was there, I would like go through the collection and just pull up books that have cool names or uh, cool covers. And I'm like, oh, this is how I'm going to read for a little while. And for the longest time, I've been looking for like what kind of fiction I was going to be into or what I wanted to read. And I, I kind of discovered this whole like literary horror sci-fi fantasy conglomerate that like gets mixed together these days in, in like contemporary weird fiction. And when I say weird, I mean like weird with a capital W. And without working at Brooks, I don't think I would have, I might not have found that or found it as quickly. And that kind of like directed the rest of my writing career. Uh, so that was, that was kind of really cool and really important for me and uh, support your local libraries. So I'm going to read a story for you tonight, a piece of flash. It's called Fences and Full Moons. Um, it was originally published in Flash Fiction Online for their um, Halloween issue last year. And I hope you like it. So Fences and Full Moons. They'd accepted that Leah was a werewolf, invested in the thick steel chain, silver jewelry, and poured cement kennel. His father, Clark, watched 57 YouTube videos from other parents discussing building techniques, how to sink footings deep, wrap fencing beneath the structure, wire a solar array on the kennel's roof to generate electricity. He wanted his son to have the best of the best, despite the back aches and the scars on his knuckles. He'd never been handy before the symptoms manifested. The kennel had done its job for 15 cycles before Leo got out and ate the chickens. It was a small flock, only enough to supply their family with eggs for breakfast, nothing for the farm stand Clark and his wife Val dreamed of adding to the front lawn. Leo finally pried apart the gate, tore through the padlocks, and ignored the jolt from the electrified fence. Maybe a moat would have been better, Clark said, welding the gate back in place. 
But what if I drown, Leo asked at his elbow. Leo was in fourth grade, hair sheared into a bowl cut, front teeth coming and crowded. He was short for his age, a fact his classmates never failed to mention at recess. Clark joked about them staying, or Clark joked about them saying that to him on a full moon, but Val said he needed to stop talking like that. He wasn't trying to encourage violence, only to let Leo know he wasn't helpless. Did you ever see a dog that couldn't swim? Clark asked, swinging the patchwork door into place, rattling the locks. No, Leo replied. Then I think a werewolf would be fine, Clark said. So I'd swim across, Leo asked. Yeah, I guess that defeats the purpose, Clark said. Sorry, Dad, Leo said, toying with the butterfly net his mother gave him that morning, trying to get the boy's mind off the feathers stuck in his teeth. He loved insects, beetles, grasshoppers, butterflies. Moths and stick bugs distracted him from the crimson smears Val washed out of the grass, all the blood pooled in the kennel. More locks it is, Clark said, satisfied with his handiwork. Do you remember anything from last night? Not much, Leo replied. What do you remember? Clark asked, walking into the enclosure, sidestepping the water trough fed from the rain barrel. He prodded the stained mattress with his foot, leaned close to sniff for mold. The waterproof pillow top was a steep buy. They put it on the credit card, despite ridiculous interest rates. Clark could go without takeout lunches during his post office shifts for the next few months for the sake of Leo's sleep habits. Nothing, Leo said, not meeting his father's eye. Clark knew his son's memory didn't shut off when the moon was full, but he wouldn't push him on the matter. They had enough to deal with without adding another layer to the equation. Two more nights of transitions lay ahead. The locks held the first night. Then the shearing of metal on metal swept Clark from dreams. Through their second story window, he saw Leo, teeth bared, snout nosing through the welded patches on the kennel door, metal bent out of shape. One paw passed through, then the other, tearing at the ground on the other side, fighting to drag his narrow hips through the opening. Clark descended the steps two at a time, pulling his flannel jacket on as he, as he pushed open the screen door. The night was chill, the feel of rain in the air, grass slick with dew. He nearly lost his footing as he lunged for his son, Leo slipping from the kennel, bounding towards the tree line on the far side of the yard. You need to calm down, Clark whispered into his son's pointed ear, arms locked around the boy's body as Leo's jaw snapped about his face, wet and sharp, never finding purchase. As the two struggled in the grass, claws dragging blood from exposed skin, Clark could see the years stretching away from them. He'd read about teenage werewolves, the added strength, the lust, the taste for larger, more intelligent prey. Every month, the struggle would get worse. They need thicker fencing, higher voltage wires, ropes and chains that would never be easy to secure. Clark could only use his arms as restraints for so long. That would be his reality, month after month. The tree line wasn't far off. Acres of dense deciduous forest ran for miles. Clark could ease his hold, let Leo sprint for the woods. They were vast enough to swallow anything, to never spit it back out. It would be easy, a release, a push, a reset. Val would never know it was intentional. He loosened his grip, but tightened it before Leo could gain purchase. That wasn't what Clark wanted. He twisted onto his back, arm clamping Leo's jaw in an improvised headlock. Leo whimpered, hot breath drifting from his nostrils. Clark wasn't going to abandon his child to the wilderness, to the wild voices swelling in his throat. There were training techniques he'd read about, methods of containment, werewolf mindfulness, a way to press rage down inside Leo so he could actually use the mattress they'd spent all that money on instead of dragging bleeding livestock beneath the roof beams. Clark heaved, lifting Leo's sprawling body into the kennel. He couldn't repatch the fence, not that night. Instead, Clark carried Leo to the bed, sitting, leaning back against the fencing. Lupine muscles slowly eased into Clark's embrace, fight fleeing. The sun would rise in several hours. Clark could wait until then, until his son morphed back into the pale boy with the bowl cut, the boy whose hunger was no longer insatiable. And that's the story. And now I guess I will mute myself and disappear. <laughs> Thank you, Glory. Uh, doo, doo, doo. Corey, can you just talk, talk for a second so you rise to the top? Oh, there you are. Yeah. There you are. I'm, there I'm, I am. Here we go. Uh, I believe I have removed the spotlight. Um, thank you. That was great.
Um, so I am the next reader and I'm going to read my own introduction, which is gonna sound a little strange, but there you go. Um, so <laughs> Amy Janess lives on Nantucket Island off the coast of Massachusetts, where she's the programming coordinator for the Nantucket Athenaeum, the island's public library. Amy identifies as a nonfiction writer at the moment, although she has poetry tendencies. Her writer pronouns are essayist, journalist, and poet. She's the author of the 2014 book, On This Day in Nantucket History. And the name of my essay is called Night Boat. The night boat is a long ride home. The 8 p.m. trip is the last chance to get back to Nantucket, the island 25 miles offshore from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where I live. After a two hour ride across the sound, the big white steamship authority vessel will dock in darkness and let off its sleepy passengers into, depending on the time of year, either a wild Nantucket summer street party or a desolate winter ghost town. This is the boom bust rhythm of places well loved by tourists. The year island, year round island residents of which I am one accept it. Which is why I am surprised to pull into the high end steamship authority parking lot on a Sunday night in February and see that the boat's car deck will be full. Normally, only a handful of cars and trucks would be waiting to drive on. Mine is the only sedan among the 50 vehicles waiting. I'm a low rider in a sea of pickup trucks, which block my view in every direction. Some of them have Massachusetts plates, but most come from states like Maine, New Hampshire, and New York. More surprisingly, I see Wisconsin, Alabama, Ohio. You could see plates from every state in July and August, but anything not local in February is unusual. The truck parked in front of me from Maine has a pair of plastic testicles hanging from its trailer hitch. They swing to and fro right at eye level as I follow the pickup onto the boat and park behind it. I gather my things and prepare to head upstairs to the passenger lounge and notice that the other drivers wear camouflage and bright orange caps. Some leave dogs in their pickup. I see gun racks outlined in the rear windows of others. I forgot two things when I made a reservation to come home this night. One, tonight is the Super Bowl and the matchup is a corker. New England Patriots versus New York Giants. A border war in the country's northeast corner strategized by tactfully tactically brilliant coaches and executed by heroic quarterbacks. The game is also a reckoning. The Patriots will hope to settle the score after losing the Super Bowl to the Giants four years prior. Two, it is the eve of an unprecedented February deer hunt. The normal gun season is the first two weeks in December, but the state game warden sanctioned a second midwinter hunt in the hopes of culling the island's overpopulated herd. There are around 40 deer per square mile on an island the size of Manhattan. And wardens worry that with a herd so large, some animals may soon starve to death. But for island health advocates, thinning the deer has a larger benefit, a reduction in tick-borne diseases. Nantucket has the highest annual rate of Lyme disease in the country each year. And reducing the deer, deer population disrupts the insect's reproduction cycle, which needs blood to produce eggs. One deer can be a catalyst for as many as a million ticks. So I'm riding the boat home with hunters who have come from far away for the country's only legal winter deer hunt and Nantucketers will be counting how many they take. I find a seat in the snack bar at the back of the boat and watch the men line up for pizza and beer. The woman serving them food and I are the only females on this vessel. Maybe it's the Super Bowl pregame blaring from two televisions up front, or maybe it's all that neon orange and olive camo, but I can feel the men's bloodthirsty excitement drifting through the brightly lit passenger deck. 
It's the powerful night before anticipation when everything is still possible, when your team might be champions, when there might be a deer in the shotgun scope. The captain blasts the whistle promptly at eight and the big boat drifts free. It's an ominous sound, part brain bull, part train whistle. Too bad for you if you didn't plan well and miss this trip. Watch out if you're piloting a vessel in Hyannis Harbor, this boat has the right of way. That whistle has been my sonic touchstone for decades. I hear it as boats come and go through the day and I know what time it is. I hear it in bad weather and know the supermarket won't be short on milk and bread. Other towns have church bells that ground their people to a place. Nantucket has a boat whistle. I'm the only passenger sitting in the stern, reading my book by the fluorescent and reflected light of the laminate tables. Back here, it's just me and the snack bar lady. When the last man heads up front to watch the game, she looks at me, shakes her head and rolls her eyes before turning to People Magazine. I can hear the men up front though. The Patriots seem to be having a good start. There's yelling and whooping and no one comes back for more food. The screaming goes on for a long time as the ship leaves the harbor and waddles out into the deep black of Nantucket Sound. Out here, we are no place, alone in the dark with no sensory cues. There's only blackness. I realize the boat has gone quiet. As the game's first two quarters tick down to halftime, the rowdy cheers fizzled and I feel a sense of worry. There's still two quarters in the game, another hour left to the trip, when a phalanx of Roman gladiators, decadent and golden, pull Madonna's giant halftime chariot into the stadium, the men come back for more beer and pizza. They talk quietly in small groups and visit the bathroom. The first touch point of home on the night boat is Nantucket's Great Point Lighthouse, located at the tip of a sandy arm that reaches toward Cape Cod. When I can see that tiny pinprick of light, flashing at five second intervals, and then its sister, Sankety Light, spinning like a clag further east, I know there's an hour left. Home. The night boat always triggers an existential crisis for me when it's halfway between ports. Why do I live on an island where everything is more complicated and expensive? The great reasons to live on Nantucket are a fierce sense of community among the tight-knit year-rounders, access to more than half of the island's interior, which has been preserved forever as open space, and of course, the beaches. The not-so-great reasons are a two-hour boat ride every time you need to go someplace, no travel when the winds blow harder than 30 miles an hour, which they do regularly, and the highest prices in the country for fuel, electricity, real estate, and groceries. I came to the island as a college kid for a summer job. In the three decades since, I married into an island family and then divorced out of it. I held down different jobs, volunteered, shared interests with friends. In short, I built a life. Yet, I'm always on the verge of leaving, still waiting for it to feel easy. Maybe it's the wild seasonal swings in pace and people. Maybe I feel pressured from being surrounded by fantastically wealthy people who actually can afford to live here. Why I worry about losing my rented cottage or health insurance. Maybe it's knowing that as the wife of a native, I was deeply woven into the fabric of this place. And now as a single woman, I'm merely a loose thread, or at least I feel like one. As the men head back for the second half of the game, I look out the port side window, reassured to see the two lighthouses flashing their white code. It feels like a message meant for me. We're coming out of the liminal darkness, hang in there, almost home. Whatever buzz and excitement first vibrated the ship has now evaporated. By the time the Green Harbor entrance light sails by my window, the giants have beaten the Patriots again. Silky silence drifts low and heavy back to me. On the television, there's charismatic Eli Manning, hair plastered with champagne and confetti, saying how proud he is of the team, how good it feels to be champions. And then there's somber Tom Brady, black greased raccoon eyes, mm -hmm. stiff, but always professional. Mm -hmm. It's probably gonna be a lot of smells. Whoops, hang on. 
Lauren, I'm muting you. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to start again. Whatever buzz and excitement first vibrated the ship has now evaporated. By the time the Green Harbor entrance light sails by my window, the Giants have beaten the Patriots again. Sulky silence drifts low and heavy back to me. On the television, there's charismatic Eli Manning, hair plastered with champagne and confetti, saying how proud he is of the team, how good it feels to be champions. And then there is somber Tom Brady, black greased raccoon eyes, stiff but always professional, saying his teammates know they could have done better. Everyone is disappointed. But the hunters have left the passenger cabin by the time the sports casters finish with the players. They roughly shove their used pizza boxes and beer cups into the trash near me and let the heavy metal door slam behind as they trudge down to their pickups. The boat slowly chugs past the tiny harborside Brant Point lighthouse. It's a culting red flash blinking, slow as an owl, the last touch point on my way home. I too gather my things and go to my car. It's 10.15 and the drivers sit in the cold waiting to drive off. At last, the trucks in front of me start their engines. I start mine and follow the trailer hitch, flesh-colored swinging testicles onto Nantucket's deserted streets. It is home, even though I sometimes question why I'm still here. After more than 30 years in a place, you can't call me a visitor or a dilettante. Like the hunters who will be searching thickets of island scrub for deer tomorrow, I'll keep looking for my Nantucket quarry how to belong in this ever-changing, unusual place. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's see. So Caitlin Kelly is next. Um, Caitlin, can you unmute yourself and talk so I can find you? Hello. There you are. OK. Hey. I'm gonna Okay, so I'm going to brag on you for a minute, and then off you go. Um, so Caitlin Kelly has worked in libraries for a decade and is currently assistant director at the Rockville Public Library in Vernon, Connecticut. Her first public library gig was on Nantucket, as was her first poetry writing group, The Moore's Poets. She regrets that she has not once been asked to transcribe a ship captain's letter since leaving the island. She currently resides in the Pioneer Valley in Western Massachusetts and is part of a poetry group with no name. Her work in libraries has largely focused on promoting health literacy, supporting food justice and community gardening and serving job seekers. So take it away, Caitlin. Thanks, Amy. So nice to be here in virtual spirit. Um, so I love libraries because they're institutions for the people. Um, I'm really glad that they were developed and created a bunch of years ago when they were. I, I think they'd be considered like a crazy liberal conspiracy now if you were to try to <laughs> open them. Um, it's a place for enrichment, a place for entertainment. Um, and there are places where you can just be and sit and not have to pay any money and, ex and you can just exist. And I think that's rare and wonderful. Um, it's unsurprising to me that uh, libraries rank with fire departments as far as popularity. Um, I think we do such a good service for the community. Uh, I also love libraries now more than ever because their mission is to fill the needs of a community, whatever those needs are. And, and I think those have really widened over the last several decades. Um, librarians are getting out of their buildings, they're collecting data, they're collaborating with organizations of all kinds, and it's a really exciting field to be a part of. Um, over the last 10 years, I've been working in lab libraries. I've had the opportunity to work with food justice organizations and create community gardens. I've worked with independent theaters to bring literacy education to third graders. And I've worked with the sheriff's department to um, help job seekers learn how to develop interview skills. So it's been really, um, it's been really fascinating and really fun. Uh, that said, it's been a really tough year to be a librarian. Um, as much as I love being the curbside pickup delivery girl, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back to um, a, a more regular mode and I can't wait to see what we all 
do next. Um, as Amy knows, I, I used to, I usually write poems that form a linked narrative, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, I'm gonna read you some pandemic poetry and hopefully some stuff that'll make you laugh. And uh, everything is written in, or is uh, gonna be presented in reverse chronological order. So here goes. January walk, 2021. A man cat calls me from a rent -a center truck, shouts problems in a sing-song voice. I want to ask him who he's been talking to. He follows me down the road on foot, but I repel his, hey, come here's with a, oh, hi, I'm late for work, but have a good day though. Even the sidewalk makes demands. Smile, it says in chalk, because God loves you. Walking quick, my neck sweats under my too warm coat. These days, I don't have a whole lot to give to anyone who asks. I've pinned my heart to a raft unmoored. My bills are high and I'm worried that someone I care about will succumb to the virus before the vaccine counter calls their number. Is problems the right word, mister? Could be. Oh, get back in your truck. Listen, I'm not smiling for anyone behind this mask. Claustrophobia. Tables and shelves are covered haphazard with mail and books and plants brought indoor for winter. The ficus drops leaves in piles and the strawberries plotted in a plastic urn won't last the month. Bins of compost and garbage are full or overflowing. The floor is strewn with dog toys littered with dust and fur and a rowing machine lives halfway between the living room and the dining room. It's cheap plastic wheels scratch the floor. In isolation, I struggle to appreciate how warm it is here with the heat jacked up to, to 70, how the coffee flows and so does the wine, how the kitchen is almost always clean and my dog wags her tail each time I walk through the door. Please understand, the hours of cleaning are, are so soon undone. There's always a hair in my mug dark crud under my nails. A mouse has nibbled the tomato in the wicker bowl and none of us are supposed to leave. Election season 2020. This morning, the president tweeted that California is going to hell, that New York is already there and the Washington Post suggested I read an article on how to have a productive meltdown. All the therapists in New England are working overtime and the liquor stores are making a killing because without an outlet for our malaise, existential or otherwise, we may as well drink about it. There's three weeks left to this election cycle, which will surely feel like a century. And God, have we already borne so much this year. For all my trying, I can't shake the grip of wariness but toast nevertheless to that which buoys my spirits. Here's to good friends, distanced around bonfires. Enough sunlight for long dog walks, shot through with red leaves and tall, delicate asters. To poetry, family, and newly discovered Indian takeout. And to a man who cooks me dinner and minds not a bit when, exhausted, I fall asleep on his shoulder. Disaster love. You have me eating mangoes. In spring, you wrote that you love preparing the fruit despite the difficulty and mess of it. Now each week, sale or no, I seek out the rosiest mango to nestle alongside lemons in my wicker bowl. I dig a thumb into the mango side each afternoon to test ripeness. Once the peel gives to pressure, I carve sweet flesh from pit with a chopping knife ill-suited to the task. Fruit anchored in my fist, slippery as a heart plucked for sacrifice, I cut toward my hand as my grandmother does, risking knife bite. In your last letter, you thanked me for my openness and sensitivity to the life circumstances you'd unveiled. 
being a good woman sometimes means hiding disappointment. Peels cast aside, I'm left with a small pile of bright oblong slices. I wish you hadn't put me in a song. I wish you would stop calling me your friend. Though sometimes I'll dress my mangoes in salt and pepper. More often I devour my fruit as soon as the knife's set down. So eager am I. The juices drip over my fingers, down my chin. How quickly sweet slices disappear. Falling back. You can really tell that this was written before the pandemic. <laughs> and it goes in with your, your football, Amy. Falling back. Demeter's daughter and her flashy skirts are banished for another winter, giving way to rosy fingered dawn tap tapping on our windows at 6 a.m. As insistent and up and at him as a small dog that needs taking out. The politicians have talked about modifying this daylight saving system for decades. The speed of government inaction in utterly incapable of keeping pace with generations of Sheilas asking if we really want their children to wait for the school bus in the dark. Of course not, Sheila. We want all the kiddos, dogs, and hubbies to be snug in their beds at 7.30 in the morning. Arizona and Hawaii disregard federal daylight saving mandates, and even Florida. Florida has passed a bill in favor of saving sunshine all year round. Mass politicos, hang your heads in shame. How rare to be behind the curve of progress. Do you propose that residents of the Commonwealth combat the darkness are cases of SAD with prescriptions for sticky indica alongside our light boxes? We can't even vape anymore. No wonder we pin all our hopes on Tom Brady and Julian Edelman. Our vitamin D deficient hearts can only be soothed by the promise of another Super Bowl ring and the warmth of our honeys as we snuggle up on the couch, watching reruns of Netflix and trying desperately to shake off our winter blues. Um, this last poem I wrote some time ago, I wrote it after my last visit to Nantucket and it's an homage to all of my, my favorite poets there. Um, including Amy and Maggie, of course. Um, this poem is for Neil. I keep my poets in a leather drawstring pouch tucked into my chest cavity. They click together behind ribs in times of need, a shaman's rattle. They mutter the right words and urge me to be kind. I lost one. When you lose a poet, pull out all of their work. If their books are not tattered with use, make them so. Make a pilgrimage. Recall his voice, the way he held a whiskey glass. Remember the last time you saw him, standing in a doorway, smiling faintly, wearing a scarf against chill and fog. Honor him with the poets who wrote with him too, the others you tucked in your chest. Read his work aloud. It will make your throat burn, but you must. Then drink to his memory. When you make the return journey, take the country road. Find solace in soaked green trees made soft in mist and God in rain beaded on telephone wires, illuminated and dropping like stars onto a rust stained road. Thanks guys. Thank you, Caitlin. You didn't make me cry. Oh, gee, that wasn't my intention. <laughs> I love you guys. It's okay. Um, so let's bring up Autumn. I have this crazy light in my face. I can't see. I can you hear me. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, I have to make Caitlin no spotlight. There we go. Okay, I'm getting the hang of this. Um, so let me just say a few words about you, Autumn, and then uh, off you go. Autumn McClintock lives in Philadelphia and is a poet and library worker. 
Poems of hers have recently appeared in The Account, Cimarron Review, Denver Quarterly, The Georgia Review, Son uh, Sonora Review, and others. Her chapbook, After the Creek, was published in 2016. She's also a staff reader for Plowshares and the associate poetry editor of Doubleback Review. She works in the Strategic Planning and Data Evaluation Department at the Free Library of Philadelphia, which I just learned has 54 different libraries, which I, I can't even wrap my brain around that. <laughs> so uh, welcome, Autumn, and take it away. Thanks. Thanks so much, Amy. Thanks um, for inviting me to be a part of this great evening. And thanks to my colleague, Amy, Amy Thatcher, who you'll hear from in a little bit, um, who looped me in to this. And um, sorry, just pulling out my stuff here. So I'm actually not a librarian. Um, apologies for that. But I've worked at the Free Library for um, more than 12 years. And I always say that uh, no one pays you to write poems. So I ended up working in a library. So that was an English major. But um, what's so wonderful about our space in Philly is that um, the, the people here, you know, we're in a city of 1.5 million, really feel um, an ownership of, of their library. They think of it as their library. And I think poetry is kind of like that in a way, too, um, especially in our global wor world. And since there's no money to be had in poetry. For the most part, there's a kind of accessibility, sort of everyone can participate in listening and reading and enjoying it, um, similar to the library. And um, amazingly, I, I'm not sure I have any poems about libraries. So um, I thought I'd share a few things about what I've been obsessing about lately, which is mostly over the past year being home, uh, the, the natural world and our place as part of nature, but also how we um, have a hand in its destruction, um, which of course also means our own destruction. And um, this spring seems like some kind of miracle to me. The fact that um, things could be blooming right now uh, seems a miracle. So I thought I'd share a few poems that explore these ideas. Tilling. Under the trowel, a worm, unbearably raw, in its gray body, its pink body, perfect take on spring, as a petal thrust from a branch. I'm not new growth or sun bringing heat, not ready for blossom. I lift the worm to eye level, inhale and stare, then kiss. The crumb of dirt comes away on my lips. Thank you for bestowing breath to this soil as I'm only capable of pushing poison into the air. The suitcase. Two guys meet on the street and the first guy says, haven't seen you in a while, what you've been up to? And the second guy says, actually, I've been keeping bees. Bees, really? Nod. So where do you keep them? Well, I keep them in the suitcase. In the suitcase? Nod. How many bees you got in there? I'd say about, 1,200 bees, 1,200 in that suitcase? Isn't that a little uncomfortable for the bees, asks the first guy, and the second guy shrugs, ah, fuck them. Was my favorite joke for years until, like the first guy, I began feeling bad for the bees. They're in trouble all over. Follow this link to save the bees, a lady posts, and it tells you which wildflowers to plant. Though the second guy didn't specify honeybees, but aren't those the ones usually kept? Follow this link to learn the difference between bees, and I do fall down the hole of bee info on the web, which in the 90s was called the net. But you don't catch bees in a net or web, you spider, or at all, except with these wildflowers. Ooh, lavender. Ooh, bluebell. Honey. Come here. See this comb? A thousand little hexagons. A thousand suitcases. Full up, just like you like. The deer and the maple. 2040 sounds prophetic until you do the math. 
In the year of our Lord, storms will swallow the fine white tongue of New Jersey that for so long, like a deer at a salt lick, slurped the green gray sea from Asbury to Cape May. And while the doe gives up for want of water, we will take up our guns to defend this tiny rivulet here in the deep woods. May I tell a true, true story? My mom's favorite tree, the Japanese maple in the side yard, red and low with bark not much rougher than human skin. One day I climbed and broke a branch and tried, little fool, to mend it with scotch tape, winding around and around the raw limb. When mom found it, she raged inside to blame my brother and I slowly closed the door to my bedroom, holding my breath to listen. And here's one more poem and it's about cheese. <laughs> the objective. Pleasing stink of beast in black and white, exactly animal as her purpose, on the move to a broad field meant for bovine felicity and sunshine. And what if you weren't interested in gossip or haircuts or winning because you'd been domesticated beyond motherhood to artisanship? Suppose whatever raw product you produced was perfected in partnership with those who deeply loved it and knew. Oh, to actualize the grassy, salty, dense, chalky, crumbly, toothsome taste and feel each time as a small art. What abundant thanks you could offer for the entire form and function of yourself. And what then could you need? Thanks. Thank you, Autumn. Okay. Michael Mercurio is next. Um, let me just, there he is. Oh, it's very dramatic. I like your lighting. Um, so Michael Mercurio is a poet with a day job. He's the executive assistant to the Dean of Libraries at UMass Amherst, located in the Pioneer Valley of Massachusetts. His poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in Bear Review, Palette Poetry, Sugar House Review, Rust and Moth, and elsewhere. And his poetry criticism has appeared in the Lily Poetry Review and the Coal Hill Review. Michael serves on the board of Faraday Publishing Company, a nonprofit committed to amplifying historically marginalized voices. And he's the executive director of Cambridge Common Writers, an alumni organization for graduates of Lesley University's low residency MFA. So thank you for joining us tonight, Michael, and uh, take it away. Thank you for having me. It's really wonderful to be here tonight uh, on Zoom with all of you. And I love what I've heard so far, and I'm really excited about what's yet to come. Um, I, I started my professional career in libraries at the ripe old age of 14, uh, working as a page in my hometown library for all four years of high school. Um, and for those of you playing along from Framingham, that's the Framingham Public Library. It's the main branch downtown. Um, and it's a, a building that welcomed me and you know like a lot of folks here I was there a lot as a kid and got to be really friendly with the children's librarians Lucy and Alicia who uh, had a, a tremendous influence on the strange adult that I turned out to be. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Dewey Decimal section 001.942 which will come up in one of the poems that I'm reading tonight um, and I, I love being able to be a small part of a, a library. So without further ado, I am going to read some poems to you. Um, this first one was written just before, well, yeah, a little bit before the pandemic. Um, 
It is called That Golden Goddamn Light. Summer. David Berman died by his own hand, and that golden goddamn light was everywhere. My life, the margin of its own margin, footnote in charcoal or chalk. And I no longer knew myrrh from uncombusted diesel, and the asphalt was soft and stinking in the sun. Beetles, purposeful pickers, saunter the sidewalk edge, pushing into leaf litter, dandelion seeds, foxtails. This is about misunderstanding. Let sureness melt between the floorboards. Discarded coffee cans rust across a decade, dutifully hold hex bolts under worn through roof, rattled by right notes sung at right pitch, but whose voice? Into a lake of fire and what's terrible are the memories bright panes of lantern glass, beveled and tongued clean until lit, etched with alchemical symbols for mercury, salt, sulfur. In darkness, the sun is diminished, and what do you remember of light? Anything may be useful, may unravel. Grief, not the giving of it, but its collection in clay amphorae containing seawater, no one keeps track of what's put in brine. Breath and the pain of skin pinched, kept in silence. No sudden movement calls for casual gaze. The deer's eye is still, freed from blinking by the breakage of time. That poem is the centerpiece of a manuscript I've been working on for some time. Uh, that has no official title yet. It's being lovingly called The Disintegration Poems. Um, and uh, this next poem is, right now at least, the, uh, the first poem in the manuscript. It's called Thoughts on the Shape of the World. One, everything too big, too connected. Fire breaks glutted with ash became welters of scar tissue, ridging taigas, prairies, velts, Speed split from distance without acrimony, shrank the world. Still, the global audience coveted fireworks. Whining sounds the same in every language. Is it possible the trajectory of progress is a bell curve, the next century a descent into rows of grubby storefronts, the gritty, pungent American cities half recalled from my childhood? towers of concrete and glass, the late 70s, before libidinous corporate consolidation, focus-tested gentrification, aesthetic elevation sanded down raw brutalism. No revelation that lives are dull now compared to then, baited, webbed in by convenience instead of menace. Two, snow falls in streetlight into tiled foyer, Upstairs, an overheated apartment, lavish with bodies, standing, sitting, leaning, slumped against cast iron radiators draped with drying coats. The air lush, wet wool, perfumes, cloves cigarette smoke. Drunk already, we're all drunk already. I hug close a jinxed love, who in this genial interstice forgets the pain of acknowledging my entrance as though our profligate kisses would endure translation from sloppy grammar into strict rules of relationship, joint world building. Three, some moments too rich to swallow, barbed so as to lodge mid-mouth, only exiting the way they entered. If only I was blessed, my sainted memories might fade. Sluggish water holds silt. Is that some wisdom written on vellum? Four, I didn't know it would impress every subsequent pairing with its own hollow imprint, be what I needed to fill, always wanting, and so sorry as the stars, impassive relics of light. This next poem is an unusual one for me. Uh, it was published in an anthology called Voices Amidst the Virus and it has been turned into a film, uh, a short film, a student film, but uh, thanks to Cindy Hunter, Cindy Hunter Morgan, who you'll hear from later, 
Uh, it's part of a project at uh, Michigan State University. And it is very much written about the pandemic. Mercy in a cold April doesn't feel merciful. This year is already gone, passed over by salvation and succumbing. In the part still world, turkey buzzards spoke a wheel centered on the smokestack atop Hospital Hill. And I'm cascading homeward to seal the windows, deadbolt doors into useless walls. Oh patience, oh patience, the only thing said meekly while we wait. It's in the air, nothing's settled. And now for the 001.942 poem. Um, for those of you who don't live in the weird ends of the Dewey Decimal System, that's UFO stuff. Each jaw is just a lever used to crush. In flesh, we believe, but don't trust. And every named place is an outpost of now along the supply chain future, grinding scrub pine stumps into particle board, hot gluing beads to mirror frames, scuttling desertward as dawn thistles itself astride the horizon. You remember long ago that space brothers came to Palomar Mountain, to White Sands, to Turbental, with dire warnings about atomic war, benevolent ones, blonde as a Hitchcock mistress, to save us from the shame of self-irradiation. Where did they go? Who do they counsel now? Hell, what if our Anthropocene isn't an existential threat to their well-being and they won't be back? So only our exquisite plaque-stained teeth will serve to note our existence. And the last poem that I'm going to read for you tonight is called, When the River at Last Has Fled Its Bed. We parse the difference between jealousy and envy and carry curved sticks pointing nowhere. Unlike water, we wander beyond banks. The damaged world seeps, corrodes battery terminals, collects cans far below in benthic canyons. And as meanings go, was never meant for this, salvation through guilt. If it can burn, it has been burning. This is the nature of fuel, which is only ever one thing until it breaks into heat, into light. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Your uh, Dewey Decimal poem made me remember my very first year working at the Athenaeum. I witnessed this incredibly passionate argument between two li librarians over what Dewey Decimal number to put on a book. And I'm telling you, lines were crossed, things were said. It was, I was like, wow, librarians really take their Dewey Decimal very seriously. So, so I appreciate it that one. Um, so let's see, Cindy Hunter Morgan joins us next. Um, oof. Michael, could you unmute just for a sec so I can, oh, there you are, I found you. Um, <laughs> weird, okay. Um, Cindy, I'm going to make you spotlight. Okay. Welcome, Cindy, from Michigan. Let me just say a few words of introduction. Cindy Hunter Morgan heads up communications for Michigan State University Libraries, where, among other things, she writes a newsletter published twice a year. Content is designed to appeal to the academic community as well as a wider audience. In this spring, the issue features a story about how library catalogers are working to eliminate harmful language from the library catalog. Cindy is also a poet, although she, is, although she also writes short nonfiction and contributes somewhat regularly to Murder Ballad Monday, 
a blog devoted to the exploration of the murder ballad tradition in folk and popular music. She's the author of a full length poetry collection and two chat books. Arborless, Wayne State University Press, is a 2018 Michigan notable book and the winner of the 2017 Mulveen Prize in Poetry. In addition to her work at MSU Libraries, Cindy also teaches poetry at Michigan State University. She loves book arts and is in the middle of various projects now. So please welcome Cindy. Thank you. I'm going all fuzzy here on you. My light's going. Um, it's what happens when you Zoom in April in the evening. So um, libraries for me are a place of discovery and joy and mystery and possibility. My affection for them uh, and my dependence on them goes way back. And it is not an entirely pure history. Um, when I was in, I don't know, third or fourth or fifth grade, I checked out Jean Craighead George's My Side of the Mountain um, from our local library. And I, I loved it so much, I, I didn't want to return it. I loved it so much, I intentionally damaged the cover, uh, thinking that if the cover were damaged, the, the library would not want it back. So I brought it to the local librarian whose name was Teddy. And I showed her the book and allowed how I was sorry about the damage. And I sure would understand if they couldn't accept the book, um, but it turned out they could accept the book. And I think Teddy was totally on to me, but she never let on. Um, she, she didn't really make me uncomfortable at all. And she was generous and kind ever after. And she only made me love libraries more. Um, in college, I remember sitting on the floor in the library at my college library near the map cases and I'd pull out topo maps and um, topo maps mostly of Michigan places, places I loved. And, um, and I'd study the ele elevation lines and, and think about where I wanted to go and where I'd been and what I wanted to climb. Um, and now I work at Michigan State University Libraries. Um, where my office is on the fourth floor, uh, on a floor, it's a floor full of, full of, um, it's the peas, so literature. So even when my door is closed, I can, um, I can kind of feel those stories breathing outside my, my office door. It's really wonderful. Um, and it was really fun to listen um, to all who have read already. And I, I'll say that I'm sort of picking what to read based on some of what has already been read, which is kind of a fun way to pick what to read. I'll read some from, uh, read um, a couple poems from Harbalus and then a couple others. So um, <laughs> I think I'll read J. Oswald Boyd. Um, so all the, the poems in Harbalus are, most of them are titled uh, after the name of a ship and, and the year it went down. The poem is the, the books, the poems in the book are informed by, by Rex and the Great Lakes. Um, so the J. Oswald Boyd um, went down in 1936. It was a tanker full of gasoline and it got stuck on a, on a reef um, off of Beaver Island. So there. Um, I'm from, you know, you can do that when you're in Massachusetts too, but we can do it in Michigan too. Um, so it was full of gasoline, it got stuck, and <laughs> for a long time, what happened was, um, was people would take their small boats out and siphon off the gas for free, and then they motor off with their free gas. And this went on for a long time until finally the Beaver Island Transit Company bought the salvage rights and they sent out their own big boat. Um, and then that first trip out, they took out um, 20,000 gallons, came back, unloaded that, went back for a second trip. And on that second trip, um, both boats blew up, nobody survived. But the reason I'm choosing this poem is be I'm thinking about um, um, uh, <laughs> Amy's Nantucket ticks. And, um, and of course, Michigan, we, we have our own ticks in Michigan, but this is kind of my tick poem. So this is for, for Amy. 
J. Oswald Boyd, 1936, Lake Michigan. After the tanker ran aground on Simmons Reef, small boats gathered for days, crowding like piglets near a sow, suckling fuel, 900,000 gallons, as the hull of the ship rose and fell with each swell of the lake, as though almost breathing. The men in the boats cut their engines when they approached. They stubbed out cigarettes in the sludge of old coffee and took what was not theirs to take. Beneath the glare of the sun, they rode their boats like hog lice, mange mite, wood tick, stable fly, every man a vector of disease, bloated but still thirsty. And then I'll read an, another one, uh, Omar D. Conger, 1922, um, just because it's, it's so wild. And I have to tell you um, what, what is true in it, because you'll think I just made it up. Um, so the Omar D. Conger was, was docked in Port Huron in Michigan when a boiler exploded and, and the ship was, was blown to pieces. A 200 uh, pound radiator plummeted into the, uh, well, first, yeah, so, <laughs> um, so that part is maybe believable. And this is the part that is, sounds like I made it up. A 200 pound radiator um, plummeted into the Falk undertaking parlor during a funeral. Um, so it was docked right in town. And when the radiator went up, it had to come down. And when it came down, it came down through, it's just crazy. Omar D. Conger, 1922, Black River. Some said the radiator was a message from God, which caused more than a few arguments. Even among those who believed in a radiant God capable of flinging a heater through a funeral parlor, there were some who said the coming of the radiator was an expression of God's solidarity with those who grieved and some who said the coming was the beginning of an 11th plague. Whether it was wrath or sympathy, darkness or radiance, hardly made sense to others who claimed it was only coincidence. But even some who favored coincidence came to feel differently about the word. They heard only coincide, which they mouthed silently to themselves, slipping in occasional variations, homicide, suicide, genocide, so many sides. For them, the lexicon had changed. A word was redefined by tragedy. And in certain families in Port Huron, some smoldering remnant of that day lives in the language of those who survived the survivors. For them, every coincidence is a kind of death. And then I'll read um, J. Barber, 1871. And this, um, this is for Caitlin um, because of all those fruit slices dripping down her chin in one of the poems she read. Um, so the J. Barber went down in Lake Michigan in 1871. It was an old wooden boat, it caught on fire, and it was full of peaches uh, on the way to they, they, which were on the way to Chicago. J. Barber, 1871, Lake Michigan. Peach crisp, peach pie, peach jam, peach compote, whole peaches, sliced peaches. In those hours before the peaches burned, the whole ship smelled like August in a farm kitchen. The hold was full of Michigan orchards, full of juice and sugar and the soft fuzz of peach skin. The fuzz burned first, singed like eyebrows too close to a candle. And soon the skin shriveled, but not before each peach was seared. The sweet juice of summer briefly concentrated and contained before everything cooked, oozed, dripped, and exploded. 
Peaches sizzled and spit as the ship burned, as fire consumed what was made of sugar and what was made of wood, as masts toppled like limbs pruned from fruit trees, as men rolled across the deck like windfalls, bruised and scraped, and everything was reduced to carbon and loss. And then I'll read uh, two poems um, that begin with lines, they both begin with lines from Emily Dickinson. Um, and these are for Michael, who, um, who also is a big Emily Dickinson fan, as I'm sure others are too. Um, and, and, and one of them, um, uh, it's, these are the nights that Beatles love. And, and so the Beatles make me think of, of Michael's Beatles in his first poem. And of Corey's um, character, Leo, I think, who loved Beatles. Is that right, Corey? Um, these are the nights that Beatles love. It is true, these are the nights that Beatles love. And these days and mornings too. August is their favorite month. They have tracked the moon's orbit, checked the temperature of sand and gravel, measured the angle of the sun on the ferns and noted how it looks this evening like a picture of a sun on ferns. They know nobody you love is in the hospital. They know your parents are still alive. When you sit down with a bowl of orange sherbet and pause to consider the shape of sunshine on the porch floor, some general in their army of beetles, Japanese, June, cucumber, carpet, carry, and dung, blister, powder post, orders one armored creature, little tank, to rumble across the floor in front of you right into the trapezoid of sunshine you have waited all summer to feel on your feet in this moment after dinner when you thought the world was perfect. Split the lark and you'll find the music. Split the lark and you'll find the music. Though you'll have to dig and the search for art is not a clean business. First, remove the feathers. Note how thin the skin is. Consult a diagram to locate the uropegial gland. Scoop out the wax, rub it between your fingers. Now preen the feathers you removed. If you are going to slice into a bird, Demonstrate some tenderness. Use scissors to make a slit from the sternum to the vent. Part the skin, part the muscles, cut through the ribs to the base of the wing. Peel the skin back from the breast and pull out the intestines. Cut the skin from the breast up to the side of the bill. Find the soft esophagus and trachea, bronchi, and lungs. Find the syrinx. This is the avian vocal cord. Cut one corner of the mouth and pry the bill away to see the tongue. Set the instruments, scissors, forceps, scalpel, tweezers aside. Lift the bird with two cupped hands and hold it as you might try to hold water. Hold it until you feel overcome with abstraction, remorse or gentleness, fascination or disgust, power or vulnerability. Here is the music. Now sing. Thank you, Cindy. I do love a good shipwreck story. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see, Maggie Sullivan is up next. Let's see, I have to find her. 
on this long list here. There you are. There she is. So let me say a few words about my friend Maggie and then uh, off she goes. So the excitement and comfort of libraries first began for Maggie Sullivan at a library story time when she was four years old. During her career, she's worked at public and school libraries, endeavoring to bring that same magic to her listeners. Maggie is currently a library media specialist for King Elementary School in Framingham, Massachusetts. And of her work, poetry, Maggie says poetry is an entirely separate and very personal endeavor meant to work out her own traumas and truths. So thank you for joining us tonight, Maggie, and take it away. Thank you. Um, wherever I have lived, the library has been for me my familiar and comforting space, even before my new apartment or house was home. There I found my authors, my special spot to read or to study, and I have felt true relaxation and peace. In working with children, I want to guide them to the wonder of libraries. In the library, I hope they also can find acceptance, possibility, and the safety of home. Part one, depression pushed the moist cement of my fetal soul carried my hope to water's bottom, where in my dreams, I see my mother, cold, sunken, blue. I was lifted, pulled up from her dead body, eight months pregnant, desperate, completely insane with her husband's infidelity, with his island beauty, while she, the life bringer, was abandoned, cast aside, useless, in a foreign place. Low, so low she sank to her knees each day, each night, any time she could. Please God, she'd say, not this, not rejection. Pitiful weakness held close, not her child, although I was within her. Part two. I never did learn to swim, which could be the watery bad beginning or miracle birth, if the slant of today's mirror is just right for belief. I learned to keep to myself, avoid storytelling, watch for cement pressed souls with similar experience, similar, not same, not many can say their near-death experience was pre-birth. Not many can say their mother killed herself. And few can say the second led to the first. I do not swim, but I live in deep water. Darkness of all kinds is familiar. I accept all, but not self-pity, which took her soul. Power lifter. My brother, the fighter, he makes me cry. His face is red, arms taut and still. His triumph will be a new world record. He grasps from death the stone bound sword. His face is red, arms taut and still. At 58, none can match his sheer will. He grasps from death the stone bound sword. The weight comes clean reveals a scar. At 58, none can match his sheer will, the cost of childhood threaded on the bar. The weight comes clean, reveals a scar, a marring red from earth to sky. The cost of childhood threaded on the bar, his triumph will be a new world record, a marring red from earth to sky. My brother, the fighter, he makes me cry. Mm -hmm. 
worldly possessions. From every drawer and surface, I sift objects down deep through layers, time, relationships, loves. Some moments, the rear view mirror is a leaden frame. I feel the weight like burial in wet earth. I look out to the sunny day. Chickadee on pine branch flits and chirps, then lifts away. I close my eyes, fly to, through spring air, hollow boned, feather clothed. Back in the room with bags, boxes, piles, questions, I straighten my spine, sigh, use the tired muscles again. Resolving next time, I'll get it right. A simpler life when I return as a chickadee. This poem is from a collection that I wrote for my sister. She passed away in 2014. Tattoo. You shared your new tattoo a bright butterfly, blue morpho, like the ones who rested on you in the botanical gardens. It spread its wings over your bony back, a verse from Matthew about belief floated underneath. Now, I cannot remember the verse, barely the blue morpho. All I see is your small back, racked with pain, losing strength, reaching out with every bone to God. My piano teacher used red as an accent color because she had style. A stool, a lamp, even the plaid wool pants covering her cross slender legs while she played Bach for me with patient pauses and urgent crescendos. She was Margaret too, but Peg, not Maggie. Christmas was perfect at her house. Poinsettias added by the fireplace bricks and entry bench. Red wine would have swirled in large glasses held by elegant ringed fingers sparkling near the fire. It would never splatter from shrill shattered glass. Messy red blood would not exist because it would always stay under delicate skin in neat royal veins where it is blue. And this last poem has um, several nonsense words just so you're not thinking you're getting very tired. Mean Sam Speen. He sopped a spider on my chack in the med arm rack, gave me a chart malac that mean Sam Speen. He crew that I was trobic, so he manned arachnochobic, cause the day was too borobic and his chart mass steen. He crated for my helling, but I stood not safe for belling. I sheathed a meep step shelling, my full blade treen. Then mightily I tacked tolly into the torti moly. I fished that spider spoly, mushed his nuts may treen. Sam's tries true bide and gora. When I tapped a mo tamara, I fucked his check blow Dora. That means Sam Speen. He flies so shill on moving, his flood a brill is choosing. But I, my chart saw soothing, Matt sore Sam Speen. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Well done. That's a tongue twister. Okay, so our final reader tonight is Amy Thatcher. Um, let me just click a few buttons here. There she is. Um, Amy is a good sport, 
going last is never fun. <laughs> but uh, here we are. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, let me just say a few words about you and then we'll, off we'll go. Amy Thatcher is a branch manager for the Free Library of Philadelphia, where she's worked for over 20 years in a variety of branches, as well as the large research library. She's a proud native Philadelphian and a poet. So thank you and take it away. Okay, um, I, um, I'm not really into Zoom that much, but can everybody hear me? It feels weird. Yep, I can hear you. Oh, okay, all right. It is a little um, bit like sitting in a room and talking to yourself. It is weird. It's um, well, I guess um, I should say something about librarianship. And um, uh, I was just an innocent college student who decided she wanted to be an English major, and then graduated and became a waitress and read a lot of poems and other books and um, thought, what am I doing with my life? So I didn't want to like go work for the man, you know what I mean? Like, um, and then I thought the only way I can make it through life is to become a librarian. Um, so I went to library school and I have to say that uh, working here in Philadelphia, my hometown has been um, the most challenging and rewarding job I could have ever asked for. And I'm very proud to, to be a librarian here for the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, and that's what I have to say about libraries. Um, I, uh, I started writing again after a long time not writing um, when my mother died last April from COVID. And, um, and I just kept writing a lot since then. So, um, so here it is. This is, um, this is what I wrote on the, after my mother died. It's called um, Our Lady of Sorrows. And I should probably add that I grew up uh, an Irish Catholic girl and um, wanted to be a nun before I ever wanted to be a librarian. So you'll see, you'll hear all the Catholic stuff in here. Okay, so this is called Our Lady of Sorrows. I take my face to the mirror to see how well rested my regret has become. How like a girl it is, ready to play her game of hide and seek where nothing is lost or dead, especially the dead. My mother has been discovered. She has a story an apron of scars, our lady of sorrows behind the confessional. Sympathy for the devil, she said, is artful artlessness. That was her kind of compliment, a nod to failure, merciless, unlovable, correct. If luck opened a window, night would fall out of its wheelchair and pray to the Lord, stored beautiful and extinct in his tiny gold refrigerator. In the end, she forgot. Her sins were of the finest weaving, how they whispered chandeliers into the innocent darkness where I hated her wickedly, hiding my riot and hurt. My mother loved me, but it did no good. God was still out there. Okay, um, gosh. Here's another poem about my mother. Um, this is brand new. I just wrote it two days ago. It's called Novitiate. After you died, I forgave the light out of my eyes. I could see the secret of my making. Somewhere in Virginia, a man took you to suffer his imagination, loved you like a silo, like an exit ramp moving continental and huge toward the avenue. When bad things happen, you said, think of them as adventures. I listened to your stories, how possibilities resembled a long illness. You were as predictable as the dead, closing what doors were next to open. Okay. Um, 
All right, here's another one. I, I'm so Catholic, I'm sorry. I guess that was a really Catholic thing to say, wasn't it? Um, this is called Once God Was Man. I think when my mother died, I did a lot of looking back and this, this is where all of these are coming from. Once God was man. My mother said men only care about T and A, but her someday alphabet wouldn't stop me parting surely as a bridge after someone guns a car across it, taking the curve too fast in a bends I can't remember the color of, dumb and feverish before God, holy in his assigned task, brief beneath the golden cross that held my neck in two. Um, okay, I'll read another one. Okay, this one is called Fall from Grace. Be careful what you wish for, God said. Then there were headaches and painful births, Eve in agony, Adam helpless as ever, walking into centuries of judgment. What episode of the new brutal and ordinary extinctions are we on? Wearing gold brooches by the magnificent water coolers of America, thinking of what not to say, like, I wanna kiss your daughter on the mouth, she is so pretty. From water to wine, the series of her life framed behind a desk. It won't be long until she's knocked up and screaming, unable to disobey her body's rule. It was never hers. Now another accessory is placed upon her chest, bloody and splayed as if it had fallen. Um. Okay, this one has nothing to do with God or Jesus or sex or death. Um, I'll give you a break. This one's called Sad Novel. Um, sad Novel. It starts with the heroine painting the wreckage of her nails blue at a bar, waiting for the aluminum heart of her lover to show outside the laundromat. Dryers spinning their living galaxies, every house in town smelling of cigarettes and dead husbands, lost to battles no one in their right mind thinks were fair, where women grow invisible as last century's marble steps, climbed hundreds of times by the children of drunks, tramping wetly through damp alleys, then pieced and quieted by the Lord himself who at the end offers delight to the dark faces of our rebel angels, nodding to the rock anthem on the oldie station, singing, I'm just a poor boy, I need no sympathy to our made up lives. That was a, a queen quote, um, the band. I'll, I'll try to hurry up now. Um, Okay, I'm gonna read one more. Um, this is really new and I feel weird about it. And I've been working on it too much. So this one is called Past and Future Operas. This is another mom poem. <laughs> um, past and Future Operas. The past wears a light canceling crown around the house rehearsing the days of my mother, tissues tumoring the arms of her yellow sweater, tuning the old tube radio to opera, a form of death preferred by dazzling and urgent lovers of aftermath. I was born strict with winter, a little mouth full of darkness. Though the matter was uncleared, I required no explanation. I knew when she lunged with a kitchen knife that she had forgotten God's thin falsetto promises well enough to bury my totally normal future. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Amy.
it's um, I always admire people who read publicly read poems they just wrote. I, I find that very brave. <laughs> um, so that concludes um, our reading tonight. I want to thank all the readers for joining us tonight. Um, it was just such a rich and varied collection of writing. Um, and I'm happy to know you're all busily working away, um, even though we are socially distanced. <laughs> um, and I enjoyed hearing everybody's stories about libraries and, and what you mean, what they mean to you. Um, if anybody has any final words they want to share with us, please feel free to jump in. But that pretty much concludes the program for this evening. So thanks for coming. <laughs>